Welcome to the Doctor Patient Forum, a no holds barred patient advocacy podcast discussing why millions of pain patients continue to suffer, but most importantly, who caused the suffering. Join us weekly as we discuss how you can help end the untreated pain crisis. Welcome to this episode of the Doctor Patient Forum podcast. You know, for the past five or six years, there's really only been a handful of doctors who have been vocal speaking out on behalf of pain patients. And we're thrilled to have one of those doctors with us today. Joining us is Dr. Jeffrey Singer. He's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and works in the Department of Health Policy Studies. He's a principal and founder of Valley Surgical Clinics, the largest and oldest group private surgical practice, has been in practice as a general surgeon for more than 35 years. Welcome to the show, Dr. Singer. Thank you. It's great to be here. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Dr. Singer, you participated in some legislation in Arizona about maybe six, eight months ago? Yeah. In the, the last uh, legislative session, um, there were two pieces of legislation were passed that I, I testified in both of those cases, and one of them actually, I don't know if it would have been proposed by, by at the time, State Senator Nancy Barto, had I not brought to her attention the issue. So I, I'm, it was really gratifying. Yeah, she's, uh, Nancy contacted me about a year and a half ago when I was at work. I made some mistakes when I sponsored some <laughs> bills, and yeah. I recognize those mistakes. So we're grateful to Nancy. Uh, I know she put a lot of time and she seems to be invested in this issue. I heard that she may be leaving the legislator. I hope not. But thank yeah, you. Yeah, unfortunately, for... she, oh. yeah, there was redistricting and she was pitted against an incumbent mm -hmm. and lost narrowly. So unfortunately for, for advocates of a uh, more rational approach to pain management, uh, she's not going to be in the, in the legislature this coming session. Well, we can work on that. The same way we found Nancy is the same way we will find other reps in Arizona. So I wanted to sit down with you today. Bev brought to my attention this article that you wrote for Cato, and I believe it's titled Cops Practicing Medicine. Yeah, it's a white paper. We also, right before the Christmas holiday, uh, we came out with what, what the web people call an earthquake that's a term that i guess it's an inside term of of art but basically um it's a interactive multimedia uh, short take on that we actually have uh video and written narratives from doctors and patients who are victims of the uh, war on opioids and the war on drugs really that uh, that's been in effect for over 100 years now Right, right. Because history is repeating itself. Right. In fact, that was, that was sort of the subtitle of our, our white papers, Cops Practicing Medicine, the Parallel Histories of Drug War One and Drug War Two. And then we, at, at, before the, the text begins, we have a, a quote that is attributed to Mark Twain, which says history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and it's what it's doing. Yeah. So a white paper basically... Uh, I was co-authored by uh, with with Trevor Burris, who's a, a legal scholar, and at the time was in the Center for Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute, and knows a lot about the legal history of the drug war. And so we basically start at the beginning, where you know prior to the Harris Narcotics Act, which was passed in 1914, people had a completely different attitude about opioids and other drugs. Uh, well, all of them were readily available. You could even get them through the Sears catalog. People use them as remedies. Doctors prescribe them often. But of course, in those days, there weren't a lot of good medications around. And that was, those were one of the few medications that actually uh, worked as intended. And there's, there's a lot of reasons why. But eventually, uh, attitudes about these drugs changed. And they took on a negative connotation. And Congress passed the Harrison Narcotics Act, which originally meant wasn't supposed to be prohibition. It was meant to be a, a, a tax and the Treasury Department was tasked with enforcing the tax. And, and, and the way the law was written, it was originally opposed by the American Medical Association because doctors were afraid that this was going to impact their ability to, to treat patients with opioids, which had, are, you know, had been around for centuries and proven to work to treat pain. But they were assured and was put into the law that uh, doctors will not be 
in any way prevented from prescribing opioids in the course of their normal medical practice. And treasury agents were tasked with enforcing the act. And these treasury agents suddenly decided that giving uh, opioids to, to people who, for example, have developed a dependency on them and were going into withdrawal. So in order to avoid withdrawal symptoms, prescribing an opioid for them, that wasn't considered by these treasury agents to be normal medical practice. And they started arresting doctors right and left. Many people had their pain, chronic pain, well controlled, uh, you know, a, a decent life. And doctors prescribing these maintenance doses of opioids, that was not considered by the treasury agents to be appropriate medical practice. So already by around 1920, cops started practicing medicine and uh, they would arrest doctors. Eventually, we talk about this in, in, in our paper, several cases worked their way all the way up to the Supreme Court. And long story short, because people who are interested could read the details in the paper, but it, the courts tended to defer to law enforcement. So we already had this early history of cops practicing medicine. And then Drug War II took on, started under Richard Nixon when the Harris Narcotics Act was replaced with the Controlled Substances Act in 1970. And we saw uh, of opioids, much of which was not based on any scientific evidence. I remember I was, I was a medical student at the time. We doctors were trained to minimize prescribing opioids to our patients in pain. And so were the patients. So I, I can recall in the early 80s, when I was making rounds, in the early days of my practice, I was making rounds on my post-op patients. <laughs> and they were clearly in a lot of pain. You could see, you know, they had all the, all the signs of it, rapid heart rate, sweaty, grunting. I say to them, are you in pain? And they say, yeah. And I say, well, you know, I have morphine, or in those days it was more popular, Demerol, ordered for you. Just let the nurse know and you'll get, you know, you'll take it. And uh, the patient would say, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to become addicted. So oh, it's okay, I'll just tough it out. Right. And I would say to him, no, no, this is don't worry about being addicted. This is what it's for. It, it's it's worse for you to be stressing like this in this kind of pain. So on both sides of, of the of the bed, you know, both the doctors and the patients were being basically indoctrinated into this fear of opioids that was not evidence based, <laughs> as you know, I'm sure. And, and we write about this in our white paper as the uh, as the the. We got into the 1980s, more and more research was showing that, you know what, used in a proper clinical setting, these drugs are not highly addictive and they do a lot of good and we're, unnecessary, we're under medicating people for pain and not taking pain seriously enough, which we should as doctors. So that by the late 80s, there were even the National Institute of Drug Abuse Director, Charles Houston, at the time was saying that we, we have this irrational fear of these drugs that are safe when used in, in, in appropriate medical circumstances. So already by the late 80s, early 90s, both doctors and patients were starting to overcome this fear. And by the late 90s, doctors and patients, you know, had overcome it. So we saw doctors more liberally prescribed and patients more willing to, to take the pain medication. So, of course, we all know that the overdose crisis that we are dealing with today has been falsely attributed to that, to that doctors were prescribing more and more pain medicine to their patients. And of course, we've seen the pharmaceutical companies, which have deep pockets, they've become the boogeyman mm -hmm. and have been sued in class action suits. And usually they settle and and because it makes sense for them to just settle without admitting guilt and just paying a lot of money. And the politicians could chalk up another, you know, scalp. But for example, Purdue Pharma, of course, is the big boogeyman and took a big hit. At, at the peak of OxyContin's use, it never had more than 8.6% of the market share. Mm -hmm. And way before OxyContin was approved by the FDA in 1996, doctors were already increasing their prescription of pain medication because they knew that they were under medicating people in pain. So uh, I've said this uh, uh, in, on many occasions. There's an awful lot of racial reasons why drug prohibition came into, into being in the first place and a lot of overtones of that even today. What I've said many times is that in the 1980s and early 90s, and even in the 70s, when people were dying of opioid-related overdose deaths, which were in those days mainly heroin-related, for example, we blamed them. We said that these people made bad 
personal choices. They were immoral. And that's why they were dying from drug overdose deaths. But when we started seeing people die from drug overdose deaths in the early 2000s, who were mostly white middle class people, we couldn't blame them for making bad moral and personal choices. So we blamed the pharmaceutical companies and the doctors who they duped into prescribing pain medicine. As we point out in our white paper, and I've said many times in many venues, this has always been basically a crisis that's the result of drug prohibition. Mm -hmm. In fact, the University of Pittsburgh School of Public Health published a really good study in mid-2018 where they're using government data, CDC data, going back as far as they could get it. Overdose deaths have been on a steady exponential climb since at least the late 70s. The trend line shows no signs of slowing down. The only thing that's changed over the years is which drugs seem to be more in vogue and have been predominating among the causes of the overdose deaths. In the, in the, in the 80s, it was mainly heroin and cocaine. And in the, in, the early, in the 90s, it was Vicodin and Percocet. Then it was Oxycontin, which is just concentrated uh, oxycodone. Oxycodone is in Percocet. If you're a non-medical drug user who likes to use oxycodone, if you get your hands on Oxycontin, you get obviously a much bigger dose, so that made more sense. And then when the source of, as doctors were pressured into reducing their prescription. And so there were fewer prescription pain pills that could find their way into the black market for non-medical users to use. The next thing the, the prohibition fueled black market did was substitute heroin. So by around 2010, we started seeing heroin overdoses start to take off and become predominant again. And another thing we point out, many of your listeners are going to hear it here first. Keep your eye out for the next drug that's going to replace fentanyl, which is a category of drugs called nitazines. Oh nitazines were developed uh, by Sibagaygi Siga Siga back in the 50s. It's a synthetic opioid like fentanyl, depending on who you read, it's anywhere from five to 20 times more potent. Oh. And uh, already by 2019, toxicology reports were showing nitazine related overdose deaths in Europe, in European countries, Belgium, the UK and elsewhere. Uh, now, just recently, I have a blog post about this that Tennessee Department of Health found a lot of nitazines. They're starting to become more evident in the overdose deaths in Tennessee. The reason we don't hear much about it is because when they do postmortem toxicology studies, they don't they don't think of looking for nitazines. But if they start looking for it, they're finding it. And there's a thing that people in the, in the drug policy world call the iron law of prohibition. It's actually a, a variation of an, of an economic law called the Alkian dash Allen effect. Uh, I don't want to get too into the weeds here, but basically the shorthand version of it is the harder the law enforcement, the harder the drug. That's just the nature of the beast. If, prohibi the, if, if you make prohibition, if you enforce it very tightly, that incentivizes the, the, the drug dealers, the dealers in the contraband, to come up with more potent forms so that it could be smuggled in in smaller amounts and become easier to smuggle. And when you're taking all that risk against the law enforcement, what you smuggle in could be subdivided into many more units so you can get more bang for your buck. That's why, for example, cannabis prohibition led to much more concentrated forms, you know, concentrated THC in, in, in marijuana. And that's that's how cocaine, uh, powdered cocaine developed crack cocaine. And in fact, if it wasn't for the Iron Law prohibition, we might not have seen crack cocaine. And that's why heroin was replaced by fentanyl and fentanyl is going to be replaced by nitazine. During alcohol prohibition, they weren't smuggling in beer and wine. They were smuggling in the hard stuff, whiskey. And there's a real life, for those people who aren't familiar with this, there's a real life example of, of the iron law prohibition that we, we see every Sunday at football games. When you're tailgating outside, people are usually drinking beer and wine, but you're not allowed to bring any alcohol into the stadium. So usually people are smuggling in in flasks. The reason why it was, it's been wrong all along to blame the doctors and the pharmaceutical manufacturers and the pain patients who've suffered is if you just look at the government numbers. Since 2002, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has been doing a national survey on drug use and health. And the percentage of adults 18 and over addicted prescription pain pills has never varied. It's been always less than 1%. No matter how many opioids have been prescribed during that time period, the prescription volume has doubled and then come down 60%. It doesn't matter. There's a less than 1% addiction rate 
the prescription pain pills among persons age 18 and up. Not only that, again, according to this survey, past month's non-medical use of prescription pain relievers by patients 12 and up has been essentially unchanged since they started taking the survey, as well as past year diagnosed with prescription pain reliever use disorder. Mm -hmm. So if there's no correlation between the number of prescription pain pills prescribed and there's no increase in the addiction rate, the narrative that everything was just fine until these doctors started hooking our young, healthy teenagers on opioids and turning them into people living on the street shooting drugs is completely wrong. There's always been a a population of people who are non-medically using drugs and I'm not a sociologist uh, and it's, um, or an anthropologist, and I'm sure it's a very complicated, there's very complicated reasons, but we've been seeing that population increase. More and more people are willing to, to engage in non-medical drug use, some recreationally, some are self-medicating. Whatever the reason may be, we see a growing population doing this. And, uh, and, and during the early part of this century, as prescription pain relievers were prescribed more liberally, they were more available to be what the, what the law enforcement calls diverted into the black market. And to be honest with you, as a doctor, I, I think it's better if people are going to non-medically use drugs, it's better to use a diverted prescription pain pill where you know yes. it's exactly what it says. Yes. It is. That, and, and, yeah, and Bev <laughs> says that all the time because I have a friend, a good friend of mine who is a prescriber and she's always concerned with patients diverting medications. And I think some people now have to sell their pills so they can afford to pay for these doctors who have become cash only in hopes that they're flying under the radar from the government. But, and Bev has explained this to me. Uh, and when I tried to explain this to my senator, he looked at me like I was crazy. But at least that di- those diverted pills are safe pills. That's a safe right. opioid supply. Yeah. Right. It's not laced with anything. And and when you try to explain this to your federal senator, what what a safe supply is, they look at you like you're insane. And they've actually spoke, you know, they said so many times, Claudia, you want me to go on the floor and explain why it's okay to divert pills? And you have just thank you for that synopsis you've just given us. So basically, the Treasury agents who were working under Harry Anslinger were replaced by DEA agents today. Right. Working uh, under Richard Nixon first and then. Right. Oh, and then we and unfortunately, today. you know, so Harry Enslinger was reincarnated into Jeff Sessions under the Trump administration. And although I, I think Trump, you know, was advised incorrectly, he listened to what people were telling him and he took a bad situation. He made it one million percent worse. And uh, we uh, we just think that 2023 is going to be another terrible year for overdoses. But it's going to just take a further hit to the pain community. I, I want to backtrack because you're, you're a doctor. You're still operating on people as a surgeon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm, I don't know how bad, how good things are in Arizona, but I know if you're a surgeon, you still have to write scripts for yeah. opiates to some people. Well, that, that's the, this brings us back to how the conversation opened up. So Arizona, like, 38 other states hurriedly passed all these restrictions on doctors prescribing because they bought into the narrative that that's why everybody's dying from overdoses. Mm -hmm. So uh, the governor, who's about to to finish his term in a week, he did a lot of good things, but he called an emergency session of the legislature back in uh, 2016, I believe it was now. They introduced the bill on a, on a Monday, and there were no hearings. The Arizona Medical Association, the Arizona Osteopathic Association, and others all asked if they could testify. And no, it was such an emergency, there was no time to deal with, to, to have hearings. And so both houses passed it, even though when they passed it, some of the leaders in the Senate were on record and quoted in the press as saying, but they've Quick, nobody wanted to be accused of being soft on drugs or unconcerned about the overdose crisis. So it got passed and signed into law. And what it did was it, it established uh, dosage limits. You can't prescribe more than 90 morphine milligram equivalents per day unless you get a consultation from a board certified pain specialist to say it's OK, mm-hmm. uh, which, of course, you know, th- that is not necessarily easy to do because they're going to want to see the patient. They're not going to want to take liability. And uh, that could be hard to get your patient in. Um, and um, it also required that doctors, in order to, to, even if they have a DEA narcotics prescribing license, 
which you, of course, apply to the government, the federal government for, uh, the state will not allow your prescriptions to be filled unless you certify, you, you show proof to, to the licensing board every two years that you've taken this three hour course that teaches you about how dangerous opioids are and how to minimize addicting your patients. So that got passed. And so we saw it sort of seeing a lot of patients getting, um, uh, you know, we abruptly tapered, cut off from pain medicine. It was really bad uh, as far as us surgeons are concerned. So I, for example, I perform a surgery on a patient at a hospital. And when the hospitalist would send home the, the patient, they sent them home with like uh, most of the hospitals are employed by the hospitals, by the way, and the hospitals tend to not want to do anything to attract the ire of the government. So they, they just basically unquestionably follow orders so that they would instruct the hospitalists to, to minimize pain ma- management. So they'd send somebody home like with two days worth mm-hmm. of an opioid after a major abdominal operation. And then the patient would call me and say, I'm out of pain pills and I'm uh, suffering. And in my state, I'm not allowed to just e-prescribe in some more opioids to that patient. I have to have that patient brought to my office and see that patient in person before I could refill the opioid prescription. So what is it for, because this is what we're working on now. We're trying to lift, we're we're trying to remove the barriers from what a doctor can prescribe for acute pain. So in Arizona, what's the MME that you can write for one of your patients after you perform a Whipple procedure? It's still 90, but what Senator Barto did, again, you know, this is legislation. So as we've learned with this this past uh, omnibus bill that passed right before Christmas, you know, there's a lot of sausage making involved. <laughs> so Senator Barto introduced a bill that still had it. Doctors can't prescribe more than 90 morphine milligram equivalents in a 24-hour period. But there are exceptions. And it listed a whole host of exceptions, including for the management of chronic intractable pain. And it defined that. And uh, when she asked me what I thought, I said, well, you still have that 90 morphine milligram equivalent in there. And she said, I understand that, but I, I, I don't have a problem getting this passed. I have a problem avoiding it getting vetoed. The governor was very, very invested emotionally in that 90 number. So I put all these exceptions in. Is there anything I left out? <laughs> and I actually uh, suggested a few other things that she left out. So it's it's better than it was, but I'm still frustrated that I even when I testified on the bill, I said, look, the new CDC guidelines that are going to be coming out before the end of 2022, this 90 morphine milligram equivalent garbage is based on junk science, largely out of pain score studies done on cancer patients in the 1980s that were totally subjective. They have no toxicological value. They're not related to to respiratory depression, anything. And the CDC realizing this is going to not use this when they come up with the new guidelines. But in Arizona, we're going to be stuck with 2016 discredited. Right, right. right. Yes. And that's what I said. Yeah. Well, that ended up, I think, and I heard the debate afterwards on the committee, that got them to go along with Senator Bartow's bill. But the 90 is still in there to get the governor's signature, which it did. And I guess the plan is that to come back, do some cleanup. In a, in a year or two saying, yes. instead of having all these exceptions, why don't we just simplify it and get rid of the 90? Right. And, and that's what we're going to do. And this is, so listen, if you're listening to this podcast and you're in Arizona, now we have to start to pluck up some new reps. And I believe 2023 is really going to be the year where people start paying attention because I have lawmakers calling me now looking for doctors. Now that the conversation is had, it's so important for people to contact their district rep. So, and Nancy Bartow, unfortunately, her time is gone. And your governor, thankfully, you know, they're on their way out. And and a lot of these governors, they've divorced themselves from reality. And they are married to the 90 MME. And and so is your legislature because they don't understand it. Well, it's so much easier to blame this. Not only that, you know, there were some really high profile stories. There were doctors who were definitely operating pill mills. We heard of the the, what they call the Oxy Express, where, you know, drug dealers would fly down people from New York to Florida and tell them to go to this pain clinic. Yeah. And and then get this prescription filled by this particular pharmacist, this ph- pharmacy, or we, there was a doctor arrested in, in Newport Beach, California. Every Tuesday, we go to a Starbucks and sell OxyContin prescriptions for $600. But I've pointed out, yeah, that's true, but don't blame the overall majority of doctors and don't blame, don't make the patient suffer and don't blame the drug. 
Yeah. Blame prohibition again, because if you could make six hundred dollars a pop selling an oxycontin prescription because of drug prohibition, yeah, and it, where it may take you an hour's worth of work to make two hundred dollars as a, a family doctor, drug prohibition is what made that worth six hundred dollars a prescription. The same thing. So, so yeah, there were doctors who were using their medical license as a cover for basically being drug dealers, but that's because prohibition makes it so lucrative. It corrupts the corruptible including police and politicians. Yeah. So that, the, but nobody wants to, to put the blame where it belongs. Instead, it's, it's just easier to say, you see those doctors when they prescribe, you know, a thousand Oxycontin pills at that, that pain clinic in Florida. That's why we have the sure. overdose crisis we have today. And that's absolutely untrue, but it's easy to latch onto when you don't want to accept the truth. And the indoctrination is so thick. I, I mean, I feel like when I'm speaking with you know, lawmakers, they have this glaze over their eye yeah. and they, they so badly, well, they've been indoctrinated and nothing will change their mind. We're going to switch gears quickly because I put out a video yesterday on TikTok and it's already received half a million views and it was discussing the No Pain Act and you were kind enough, you just uh, wrote, I, I, I think you blogged about the No Pain Act. What are your thoughts about it? Uh, you're talking about the, uh, Act. In, in the omnibus bill? Yes, the, yeah. yes. Well, you know, that's that's another one. My blog post was that Congress made it easier to, to treat addiction and harder to treat pain. So what doctors uh, and uh, just a whole host, even Dr. Nora Valkow of the National Institute of Drug Abuse have been calling on is getting rid of called the X waiver. If you want to treat addiction, if you're a primary care or uh, internist or, or any other specialist, if you want to treat a patient with, a, with substance use disorder using buprenorphine, a uh, brand name Suboxone, uh, you have to take an eight hour course and apply to the, to the DEA for a special waiver on your narcotics license. So there's an X along with the number. That's why they call it the X waiver. And it's very cumbersome and it's disincentivizes a lot of doctors from participating. So there's, we have, you know, all these people who need, who need help for substance use disorder and not enough doctors who are willing to, to go through the process of, of being able to prescribe buprenorphine, which has shown to be an effective form of what's called medication-assisted treatment of substance use disorder. So many, many organizations have called for getting rid of that X waiver requirement. It had bipartisan support in, in Congress. So by the summertime already, Congress passed a bill uh, that I think they call it the uh, Mainstream Addiction Treatment, Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act. And they passed that that basically removed the X waiver. So that was that was good. It also, along with the X waiver, was a limit on how many patients you could be treating at any given time for substance use disorder, which again limited your, your, the ability for you to help people. So that was lifted. That's good. But at the same time, in that bill, in that omnibus bill, they passed a bill called MATE Medicaid. What is that? Uh, something Addiction Treatment Education. Yes. I forget the exact what, what it stands for. But basically, it now, instead of having to take an eight-hour course to get your X waiver, you have to take an eight-hour course. Every doctor has to take an eight-hour course to renew their DEA narcotics license or to, to get one if you just get it starting your practice. And that's on top of, of course, the state requirements. Like I mentioned, Arizona, every two years, you have to take a three-hour course. And 40 states have course requirements like that. So... If you're an orthopedic surgeon in practice for 20 years and you want to prescribe and, and you have a therefore a DEA license so you can prescribe narcotics to your post-op, let's say total knees and total hips or whatever, or pelvic fractures or, or spinal fractures, well, when it, when your license is up for renewal, you got to go take an eight-hour course now to teach you how to prescribe this stuff. Who, who, who's, host, who's hosting that class, that eight-hour well, class? Well, right now it says it has to be a course that's accredited. Forget all the specifics, but it has to be approved by the government that it's an accredited course that covers the range of issues. What's going to wind up happening, I could tell you as a doctor who takes these mandatory courses, there are going to be companies that are going to come along and they're going to hire doctors who, for a fee, you register and you can take this online course and, you know, you take several hours and then there's a quiz after each hour to prove that you've taken it. And then after you get enough right, if you get 70 percent or whatever, you you could generate a certificate, which then you show when you renew your license. That's how it will work. But this is only going to discourage doctors. For example, if if you're a primary care doctor who doesn't that 
doesn't if you're a surgeon one of the most common drugs you prescribe is a narcotic because you're dealing with pain all the time narcotics and antibiotics are your two biggest class of classes of drugs that you prescribe if you're a primary care doctor there's a whole host of drugs you prescribe blood pressure meds antidepressants diabetes meds and among them are narcotics well, if, if you may just make the decision, you know, I don't have time to take this eight hour course and I got to spend money on this. I don't see enough patients in pain. Screw it. I'll just not renew. And if I have a patient in pain, I'll refer them to a, to a pain, pain specialist. Yeah. Right. And that's what's going to wind up happening. So, and, and of course, that's based on this, again, this false narrative that we doctors are addicting people and all these people who are dying right now from taking fentanyl that was smuggled in in place of heroin which was smuggled in in place of counter of, of diverted prescription pain pills, all these people, they were created by us doctors, which is absolutely untrue, especially now, you know? So, yeah. so they're making it, but it's based on that notion when, when, if you look at the government's own data, the addiction rate for people 18 and up to prescription pain pills has been under 1% ever since the government started tracking it. So at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that they got rid of the X waiver. That was a right. good thing. But it, it was like they gave with one hand and took away with the other because now they're going to make it harder for patients to get pain medicine. But, that, it, but and that's I, because you have lawmakers practicing medicine. Exactly. Not just cops, lawmakers, too. And I, I mentioned I, I, we mentioned that in, in, in our white paper, too. We say you cannot legislate how to practice medicine. Treating pain. We, this is in our conclusion of our paper. Treating pain is as nuanced as treating other, any other medical condition, whether you're treating diabetes or high blood pressure or, 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 or you know, even an infection. The, the patients vary, the situations vary, the responses to different medications vary, and you cannot cast in stone. In November 2022, the, the CDC said, the, the CDC stopped recommending a 90 morphine milligram equivalent uh, dosage threshold. But in Arizona, it doesn't matter. We're stuck in 2017. So you, that's the problem. Everyone in this country is, is experiencing COVID for the last three years. I mean, let's let's face it. Every week or so, we were getting mixed signals from the public health people. And part of that was because it was it's, it, it's we were the knowledge was evolving. You know, we never had a COVID pandemic before. We didn't never had this virus before. And and so at one moment's time, we thought we understood something. And then when more information came in, our understanding changed. And sometimes our recommendations changed accordingly. So thank goodness we didn't, you know, pass a law in, in a national law imposing April 21st, 2020's understanding of what to do about COVID on the whole country, because we'd be three years behind now in how to deal with COVID. But that's what we're doing with pain medication. Yeah. I, about the MADAC, Dr. Singer, I'm a little bit confused. Why are the same organizations like, you know, Shatterproof and, and things like that, they want, they pushed for the removal <laughs> of the X waiver, like you said, which is good, but they also pushed for for this made act. So wouldn't it just, they're taking it away and giving it back yeah. to the same doctors who they're saying maybe were deterred to prescribe Suboxone. Why would they want them to have well, the same class again? It doesn't well, my, my understanding is that the founder of Shatterproof, I think his son died of a heroin overdose. He, he actually took his life. Right. Was it Pardon me? Heroin and he killed himself due to stigma. So right. So he's totally invested in this narrative that doctors hooked young people you know there's this typical story you hear still on the news uh, you know a high school athlete broke his leg was given a prescription for uh, oxycodone right. and next thing you know he's on the street shooting heroin and there may be some occasional cases like that but the overwhelming majority of the time you find out these high school kids were using drugs regulation with their friends yeah no definitely but uh, yeah so he's he doesn't want to i you know i don't i'm a parent i sure. I, I totally empathize with this guy who right. who who founded this so he's still bought into that so he he's all for treating addiction because he wishes his son had his addiction treated so he's going to be good on things like harm reduction right but he's not going to be good on things like treating pain because he's convinced that it's we doctors treating pain patients that are responsible for all of this despite the evidence and you know look if if if, if, if cutting down on prescribing is the solves the problem then we have 40 states that require doctors to take these courses since in, in my state since 2016. We have uh, prescribing it peaked in, in, in 2011. It's down 60 percent since then. How are those overdose deaths doing? They're soaring. They're skyrocketing. 
So there's no connection, but you know, I, I don't know what it's going to take to get them to finally drop this. That's my next question for you because right now we're stuck in this whole, you know, the CDC is coming forward and they're like, Oh, we removed this threshold and everyone, all the media is like, Oh, it'll make doctors more willing to prescribe and they're easier to prescribe. But yet what we hear patient stories things have gotten tremendously worse, even since November, like everyone's being, it's, to me, it feels like all our calls, all our messages are abandoned patients, forced tapers, cut off cold turkey, Mm -hmm. no one will take them, no one will see them. And a lot of this Dr. Singer, a lot of patients say, my doctor told me no more prescribing at all as of January 20, January 1st, 2023. And I don't understand why that date, like our doctors just so afraid of the government that they're like, I can't do this anymore. I think most are it's fear. It depends. It really depends. The younger doctors just coming out are already being indoctrinated in med school, like I was in the in the, in the seventies. They're coming out and being the and I see this when I'm at the hospital. The younger hospitalists, they're putting people on Tylenol for kidney stones. I mean, you know, so kidney stones are considered among the worst pain yeah. you can experience. Yeah. Um, so they, that's because they're being trained this way. But the 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 older doctors. The, it's fear because they've been around long enough to know they've had patients for years that they've been prescribing opioids for, for pain, and they've not seen them become addicted. You know, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with Dr. Stanton Peel. I, I've seen him do this many times in front of audiences. He did this in front of a Cato Institute audience when he was part of a, a conference we had at, at, at the Institute. He said to the audience, how many people here have ever taken an opioid uh, you know, for a, a, a post-surgical condition or something like that. And almost everyone raised their hand. And he, then he said, how many people here became addicted? And nobody raised their hand. Right. And he goes, none of you? What's wrong with you people? I just, did, I just did that at my Christmas party. I do at all of my <laughs> gatherings. I was like, who here has received a script for an opioid? And who here has graduated to the streets? That's right. after. Right. And I don't, you know, I got to tell you, and, and I know Bev will agree, Years ago, when I started this, my pain patient stories used to keep me awake until the doctors found me. And what the DEA and state medical boards have done to doctors, they have destroyed their lives. Dr. Bill Bauer, 86 years old, incarcerated as we speak. He's been there for six months. They have they have destroyed, destroyed the medical profession. And as long as there's fear in the clinic, I don't think much will figure out. How can we eliminate fear from the clinic? Well, we can, you know, maybe one day the Controlled Substances Act will be repealed. I don't think that will be in my lifetime, perhaps in my grandchildren's lifetime, because billions of dollars are invested in the yeah. Controlled Substances oh, Act. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a job program, too, you know? it's uh, but, all of, it, but, but here, another thing that could help, but this is only on the state level, this was the other bill that Senator Bartow carried that, that I had told her about uh it's now arizona became the 19th state to do this your state claudia rhode island Mm -hmm. had this and inexplicably repealed it so you uh law enforcement the local drug task force sometimes like to go through the you know every state has a pdmp prescription drug monitoring program where they keep track of every prescription for a controlled substance that's written and law enforcement will, will ask to see the pdmp and then they kind of go on a fishing expedition looking for some doctor who, oh, look at this. This doctor prescribed, you know, an awful lot of oxycodone. Let's uh, let's do a raid on that office. And that's what they would do. And that petrifies doctors. So um, um, in, in, in my state of Arizona, for example, it said law enforcement could request to look at the PDMP. And all they have to do is say to whoever oversees the PDMP that there's an ongoing investigation. Yeah. Okay, so in many states, uh, they have a law that was passed that says you can't look at the PDMP without a, a warrant showing this probable cause that a statutory crime is being committed. And if there is probable cause, you shouldn't have any problem getting a warrant. Uh, so uh, 18 states had it. Arizona did. But he said, actually, at a meeting I was at. But I got to tell you, your biggest problem is not going to be local law enforcement is going to be the, the feds and they're going to say that this doesn't apply to them. Yeah. And he was right. So Rhode Island had that law on the books and they took it off the books. New Hampshire, you probably are aware they, 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 they had the law on the books and the DEA came to 
the New Hampshire PDMP director and said, we'd like to take a look at the PDMP and was told, come back with a warrant. And they said, no, you don't understand. We're the feds. We don't have to obey state law. And it went to court. And unfortunately, this, this, the PDMP director, Jonas, it was called Jonas versus Drug Enforcement Administration, I think, or Jonas versus the United States, lost uh, on the district court level and the appeals court level. And this spring, the Supreme Court refused to grant cert. So it didn't go to the Supreme Court. So on the federal government, the DEA, it's not going to stop the DEA. Right. But despite that, it could certainly help because, you know, every city and, and a lot of state and local communities have drug task force, and at least they'll have to get a warrant. So it'll cut down on the amount of, uh, of, of these kind of raids, because usually what winds up happening, and on this earthquake that's on our website right now, the, compa- the digital com- uh, the interactive companion to a white paper, you know, we have video and written testimony. For example, you know, SWAT team will come storming into a doctor's office in the middle of office hours with the patients in the waiting room, you know, with their bulletproof vests and their helmets and their automatic r- weapons because, you know, doctors are always armed and dangerous. Sure. And then yeah. and and during around, clinic, and then, right. Right. And, and all the TV, local TV news cameras watch them being, you know, walked out in handcuffs. Most of the time, they're never charged. They're told, well, surrender your narcotics license and we won't press charges. But meanwhile, their practice is destroyed because nobody knows that they were never charged. They just knew that this guy was arrested for dealing drugs and now the practice is destroyed. Yeah, and and the the case just lingers with these agents. They they don't have anything on the doctors. But at that, by the time... You know, this just happened. This happened to a psychiatrist in Rhode Island. He said they came, and that's the only. We don't have that. It just it's not an occurrence in Rhode Island because we're such a small state. The feds don't want to expend resources here, but the FBI went into a psychiatrist office. He was writing uh, Suboxone scripts primarily. He was writing to uh, p- pilots for the airlines, and the feds came in, terrorized the man, took his uh, hard drive, left. He never heard another word from the feds until uh, six months ago. And they said, well, we're going to keep everything, including your assets. And the case is going to go away. I said, screw that. That's bullshit. They don't have anything on you. Don't let them get away with it. They're like highwaymen. They're like highway robbers. No, it's it's the mafia. They take your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. They're like pirates. They take, they, they want what's yours. They have no, there's no charges. And I know prosecutors prosecutors are lazy and if they have to get a warrant to stalk the pdmp five times out of ten they're not going to do it because it's well, too much work so why did they take it off the books in rhode island then they, they used because they used to require they were a warrant in, they were indoctrinated and the aclu fought for it they didn't want this to happen but the i, I always say the word indoctrination because it's so thick But here's the good news, because I know people who are listening to this podcast are getting discouraged by the minute. And we yes, we do have a lot of work to do. But I promise you, everybody's suffering now. There's too many people who are suffering for this situation to be ignored. And that's why we need people to contact their district reps so we can get sponsors and co-sponsors to get more legislation uh, because nothing's going to change on a federal level. But if we can get all 50 states, at least in a copacetic place where doctors, you know, Rhode Island has Senate Bill 384 now. They're exempt from the CDC guidelines, but I have to go back to the state house because they were exempt from the, the 2016 CDC guidelines. So now I have to go back and say, well, I need the bill to be rewritten to you know, reflect the 2022 guidelines. But what we're trying to do is I want doctors to be able to prescribe whatever they need to after surgery. Right. So let's remove right. all barriers. My, I have to trust that my surgeon knows how to operate on me better than you who sells insurance during the day and you're here at night for six months a year. My surgeon knows more about medicine than you do. Let the doctor be the doctor. Let's let's protect the sanctity of the doctor-patient relationship. And I know we can do it. This is the year of the pain patient. By the way, we didn't even touch on the fact that also be based on the same wrong narrative. So the DEA each year sets quotas on what the drug makers can make, how, how much morphine, how much oxycodone, how much hydrocodone. 
in the pill form and the injectable form, how much fentanyl medical, you know, licit fentanyl for the entire country. They're supposed to, which, I mean, this is amazing. They're supposed to know how, how much of every type of opioid in every form, 330 million Americans are going to need next year. That's because they they're, cla- the that's because they're clairvoyant. That. They're clairvoyant. You didn't know that they yeah. taught that. <laughs> they not, they know more than, than anybody could imagine to know these these, 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 they're omniscient, obviously. So they make these decisions, and now we, of course, have shortages develop. Uh, sometimes uh, shortages of basic things like morphine, injectable morphine in the hospital. There have been times when, when uh, elective surgery had to be postponed because we didn't have enough intravenous fentanyl or morphine to use in the operating room, and we just had to postpone it until we until until the manufacturers caught up, um, and so. We do have in our white paper, we have a couple of recommendations. One is that the recommendation one is states should resist efforts to codify any guidelines released by state and federal public health agencies uh, and to repeal those that they have. And actually, public health agencies shouldn't be in, in, in the business of issuing guidelines. The CDC was supposed to take care of, you know, communicable and infectious diseases. Best practices guidelines are usually uh, issued by specialty institutions or American College of Internal Medicine, the American uh, Society of Addiction Medicine, the, et cetera, et cetera. They're, these are associations, organizations, uh, educational academic organizations of uh, specialists who have committee meetings and they come up with what they think is best practices. That's those are the people who should be coming up with guidelines, but guidelines should not be codified. And the DEA should no longer be empowered to impose any manufacturing quotas on opioids. And like I say, federal should Congress, the U.S. Congress should pass a law requiring that federal law enforcement get a warrant before perusing a state's prescription drug monitoring program, as well as all states should do that. And then um, and then what should happen on the state level is that if law enforcement were to get a warrant uh, and they go through the database and they see no evidence of a statutory crime being committed, but the, the you know, agent, the federal agent thinks that Dr. So-and-so is prescribing an awful lot of OxyContin and I think it's inappropriate, then the most that agent can do in that situation is refer that to the state licensing board because that's what they're there for. They're there to see if best practices and standard of care is being met by their licensees. And they'll review, it'll be reviewed by doctors, not policemen. And the doctor will have due process. And on upon explaining the behavior to colleagues, there's a good chance the colleagues will say, oh, okay, I don't think it's inappropriate. But that's who should handle it, not law enforcement. In my state, my medical board has, I don't know if you've heard, I'm in North Carolina, we have what's called SOPI, Safe Opioid Prescribing Initiative. And they, I think it went to effect 2016 or 17, um, where, where they actually, it actually triggers an investigation, straight PDMP, not from um, a complaint. I mean, of course, complaint based too, but PDMP metrics trigger an investigation. And some of these metrics are one patient on 100 MME or more, just one one patient on a 30 day prescription or more, that doctor, an automatic investigation is triggered from the state medical board. And so right away, these doctors will not take on abandoned patients because they know it will automatically trigger an investigation. And all it takes is a state board medical investigation to trigger a federal investigation. And so we have these patients in North Carolina who are abandoned and no one will take them. Nobody. Your point is well taken. The medical boards are not exactly, you know, guiltless here yeah but but at least get the law enforcement out of it and get the professionals involved but they're also under uh under a lot of political pressure yeah and 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 uh and a lot of times they're unjust as well no pressure it's and in my state law enforcement has access local law enforcement has access to our medical um our pdmp also we're one of the states that it just has access if they want it Well, well they should have to get a warrant yeah, that's I, something you should fight for in the state level. Yeah, that I think that's something it could actually be achievable in most states. But once again, we need people to contact their. I sound like a broken record. I had the door slammed on my face. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm. 
I can't tell you how many times people are like, are you crazy? Opioids are bad. Don't you know there's an opioid epidemic? I, I don't even call it an opioid epidemic. I call it a fentanyl poisoning crisis. But folks, it's really important. Connect with your district person. That's the person who represents your neighborhood. I know I sound like a broken record, but it's necessary. Uh, Dr. Singer, thank you so much for, you know, giving us the synopsis. History is repeating itself. Yeah. Now, how can uh, and I look forward to working with you for the 2023 session. I know I'll be calling on you to testify virtually. What's the best way uh, to follow your well, work? Well, the, the easiest way, is, uh, my Twitter handle is at dr number four liberty at doctor for liberty you can follow me at the cato institute website that's cato.org okay. uh and uh, uh on the top of the website it'll say uh experts if you, it's a drop down menu and you click on that and it gives uh, the every single scholar at the cato institute just click on on my picture and it'll take you to my page where everything i write or do is is there and, and i i certainly would testify but it's important for me to mention that Cato Institute is a 501c3 nonpartisan nonprofit organization. So I, I do not advocate for specific pieces of legislation. Right. So I can only, yeah. I just give expert That's you right. know, advice. You know, you talked about the three different drug wars war on doctors. As bad it is it, as it is right now, was it this bad in the 80s? Was it this bad before? Or is this, did you ever think it would get this bad? It just started getting bad in the last uh, seven, eight years, I think, maybe 10 years. In the 80s and 90s, pretty much we were just being left alone to use our own judgment. Uh, that, and, and, and that's why we saw things lightened up. We were actually getting encouraged by, like I say, the National Institute of Drug Abuse. It was encouraging us to, to stop being so fearful of this, of this medication, treat the patient's pain. So no, it really started up just uh, when, when the overdose crisis when the overdose death rate started reaching a level that caught everybody's notice like i say it's been going up steadily at least since the late 70s yeah. but it finally reached a number that attracted everybody's attention that 2006 paper do you think yeah. it's going to get better like do you have hope that it actually will and then how long until we start seeing i'm patients? i'm sorry to say that i don't think it's ever going to end until we end the war on drugs yeah. i think it's going to get like i say nidazines are going to replace fentanyl yeah. And they're even more deadly. And then something's going to replace nidazines. Yeah. And uh, in the meantime, they're going to, you know, maybe eventually they'll realize that if you make people go completely in pain and have no pain medication, the overdose rate is still going to go up because it has nothing to do with that. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not very optimistic, I'm sorry to say. No, that's okay. I, one of the things in your paper that I wanted to mention is you said something extremely interesting to me that it went from the idea of the addict patient to the idea of the addict criminal. And now it seems to me that it's the idea of the chronic cr chronic pain criminal, because that's how we're taught. That, that really is how patients are treated, right? We're treated like, right. like absolute criminals. And I just, I don't know, I just hope that that gets better, because that's... It, it's hard. Like patients are terrified because we're treated hard. Yeah, that's true. At least like back in the early part of the 20th century, doctors looked at people who had substance use disorder as with, with compassion as people yeah. who had, who had a, had a, a health problem that needed to be fixed. That's what they, that's how they looked at it. Not anymore. Yeah. No. And what we've done as a country is reality to a molecule, which is yeah. ridiculous. I, exactly. Right? Couldn't, couldn't have put it better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for being with us today. Uh, and, and I know that you work, you know, you write with Josh Bloom. Uh, I see that, you know, you yeah, occasionally co author pieces. Yeah. Yeah. It was just a pleasure to have you, Dr. Singer. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Doctor Patient Forum. Don't forget, leave some notes in the comment section for us. Uh, perhaps Dr. Singer can answer some questions of yours in the future. And we wish you folks all a beautiful, happy, healthy new year. You heard Claudia mention the No Pain Act in this episode, and I want to give a brief explanation as to what it is. No Pain Act recently passed. It stands for Non-Opioids Prevent Addiction in the Nation Act, the No Pain Act. And this bill establishes separate payments for certain non-opioid treatments under Medicare payment system for a hospital outpatient department and the payment system for ambulatory surgical centers. So basically what this means is if you go for, to an um, ambulatory surgical center, an outpatient clinic, and have a surgery, a bundled payment means they're given one payment 
to pay for whatever that that surgeon chooses to use. So all of the medications, including opioids and everything gets paid under this one payment. So to them, it's, it's probably more beneficial in a case like that to use something that's less expensive, right? Because then there's more money for them to make. Well, if something is unbundled, it means that it's paid separately. So the only company that I've seen that benefits from this is Pacira Pharm Pharmaceuticals. Well, also Huron, I'm sure if it's being used because they make a similar product now. And what they both make is a product, Pacira is called Expero. And I think Huron's called Zin Relief or something like that. But it's not a pain medication. It's a long acting numbing agent, really. There's a product called Bubificane and it's just a numbing agent. And it lasts a certain amount of time and it's very common to use in surgeries. Then there's Expera, which is a slow release of this form. That's it. That's all it is. And it's, I don't know, five, 10, 20 times more expensive. I've heard a bunch of different numbers. I've heard up to a hundred times more expensive. I heard it, the regular is $3 and this is 300. I'm not sure the exact cost difference, but I know it's a lot of money. And there really isn't a lot of evidence that it does anything great. Now, you've seen Pacira Pharmaceuticals joined forces with Gary Mandel and Shatterproof, Choices Matter campaign. They've really, really pushed this as a way to solve the opioid crisis. Uh, but it can't solve the opioid crisis. And we're not even sure that it does anything more than regular bubificane, other than make this company a lot of money. So I meant to ask Dr. Singer about, about this product because he is a surgeon. And so I wanted to know what he, what he thought about it. And he responded that he hadn't really used it much. But then he said the following quote, I spoke with my anesthesiologist who happens to be the chief of anesthesia here. And he tells me that Exparel is so expensive and of such questionable value that they only so that only certain specialists to use it for very limited and esoteric situations. Many studies show no difference in effectiveness between a cheaper bubificane and 10 times more expensive Expiral. In addition, you have to be very careful where you inject it because it could end up sitting in one place and not diffusing out into the tissue as is usually preferred when you use bubificane for infiltration. And I find that really interesting because we've been talking about Pasir and Expral for quite a long time. And uh, an anesthesiology publication, I think about a year or two ago, they wrote an article about it showing that it really doesn't have a whole lot of evidence that it does anything more than plain old $3 bubificane, right? And Pasir threatened to sue them. Now, I don't know. They did drop the case from what I know. I don't know why. I don't know what happened legally, but I know I, I believe the case was dropped after that. You know, for, for this to be unbundled, it means that a doctor can use Expirel and it won't affect their bottom line because Medicare is going to pay for that separately, right? So it's not going to affect anything. So so it, it wouldn't encourage them not to use it at all. It would encourage them to use it actually. And all this really is going to do is cause them to not use opioids and to use this. And all you have to do is look up the reviews of Expirel. It's pretty mixed. People either say 10 out of 10 or 1 out of 10. You either have people who it worked really, really well for, or it didn't work at all. They were in agony and then gaslit when they told them that they were in pain. Some people it remains numb forever. This really, to me, is what the No Pain Act was for, which is, I mean, it's, it's shady. It just seems really shady because, you know, we hear a lot about pharmaceutical companies when it has to do with opioids and Purdue and all of this and how horrible they are and how they cause this crisis and how everyone needs to be transparent and that no organization should be industry funded. But then you have a company like Shatterproof who's joined forces with them and nobody seems to care. Nobody seems to care that Pasira sponsors their fundraisers. Nobody seems to care that, that this is a pharmaceutical company, that their lobbyist is actually pushing a bill through that really isn't going to do anything for the opioid crisis, uh, but they claim it will. Um, if anything, I believe it's just gonna cause more pain for people and no one seems to care about it. And I wanna know why. I wanna know why media doesn't cover other pharmaceutical companies, other industries that's, that's driving decisions, unless they're opioid makers. I mean, was it litigation narrative? Is that the whole reason? I don't know, I'm not really sure. We do plan to do an episode on Pacira at some point. Uh, to explain a little bit more about how this came to be popular, who their lobbyist is, and all of that situation. But anyway, I wanted to let you know that. And then after that, um, you know, Dr. Singer, Claudia, and I, after we ended the interview, did talk a little bit back and forth. And Dr. Singer said some really interesting things. So I'm going to include pieces of that conversation um, so that you could learn from what he has to say. I loved this interview. I think Dr. Singer is a phenomenal advocate for us. We will uh, put in the show notes 
all of his articles and links from Cato and Re Reason and everything else that he's written, I highly recommend that you read them because he really has a lot to offer. He also has testified as an expert witness, and he also was the one who debated Adrian Few Bourbon, which in my opinion, he demolished her. Like he won outright in my opinion, but of course it ended in like a tie, they say. But I'm gonna put that link in the show notes also for you to listen to. Thank you again for listening. If you have any comments, feel free to leave them right on Anchor, or you can email me at bev at the doctorpatientforum.com or claudia at the doctorpatient forum.com. Have a great day. All right. Thank you, Dr. Singh. That was a great, Thanks. great show. Thanks. Your PDMP that's on YouTube, that, that whatever you had seminar presentation, we use so much of that in our, we linked it to our PDMP episode. Oh, as it's oh that's right. In fact, in that, that's the one we talked about the New Hampshire case. It was in litigation. Yeah. 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 We, you had the ACLU lawyer speaking. You had uh -huh. eight, uh, Nicholson. It was really, I would love to have you back sometime just to talk about that too, because that was, it doesn't seem like many people understand the PDMP really seems to be causing more harm and they're just bolstering it. Like they, it, it, it certainly hasn't reduced the overdose rate. <laughs> no, and they're throwing so much of this litigation settlement funds at the PDMP claiming it's going to prevent, prevent what it's going to, it's not going to prevent anything but prescribing. That's it. Right. Exactly. And I look forward to being in touch. Now my title is, I think it said principal and founder. I am, I'm no longer, I'm president emeritus. Okay and founder of Valley Surgical Clinics. Okay. Ba basically, uh, I'm only working part-time now. That's, okay. that's why I'm president. I founded it, but to do the work I'm doing at this stage of my life, I made an arrangement with my partners that, uh, so I'm not running it anymore. <laughs> Are you operating less? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing only outpatient surgeries, you know, laparoscopic gallbladders, hernias, because I, I work full-time for the Cato Institute now. I'm, I'm I'm 70 years old. If if I wanted to take good care of my patients, I can't do it by working part time. Of course. I, so, and I'm at a point in my career where uh, I still want to be part of the field. And not only that, I think it really helps me with my Cato work. But I I can't devote the time to the practice that I used to. So I, yeah. I worked out an arrangement with my partners, and I work on Wednesdays and Thursdays. I see p patients in the office on Wednesdays, and I do surgery on Thursdays. And the rest of the time, I'm I work eight days a week for the for the Cato Institute. Yeah, and and thank God you're healthy, right? You're healthy. Yeah, yeah, good, yeah. good, and you look great, well, well rested. Thanks. Thank you. I'm not well rested. Well, you look it. Because let me tell you, I'm all about the vanity. <laughs> yeah, well, I usually get about four to five hours sleep a night. So. Oh my God, I could never. I get about. Bev and I work good for between nine and ten hours a night. <laughs> well, remember, I'm a surgeon, so normally we're up at five anyway, and the first surgery is at seven thirty, right? Yeah. You know the story behind that? No. Uh, no. You find this interesting. So you probably heard of William Halstead. He he's considered the father of modern surgery. Oh yes, yes. He was a professor at Johns Hopkins, and around the turn of the twentieth century, he invented the residency program that we still have today, okay. and uh, many of the the techniques of the surgical techniques that we still are taught. That was all developed by him and several operations. When I just started my residency, I graduated medical school, started my residency in surgery. And I was told on the first day, okay, we show up in the intensive care unit to start rounds at five in the morning. Cause we got to be done by with rounds by six 30. So we could eat breakfast because surgery starts at seven 30. Right. And I'm thinking <laughs> who came up with this crazy schedule? I mean, people don't even, I'm, I'm starting surgery when people, their alarm clocks are just going off in, in right, normal homes. Yeah. What's going well, on here? Ben well, I found I, out, you yeah. might know this. He was a cocaine addict. Did you know that? Yeah, my, my friend is a plastic <laughs> surgeon. He told okay. me that. All right, right. And, and, and then they, they had an intervention. They took him on an ocean voyage, his colleagues at Johns Hopkins. Cause, but when I, when I heard he was a cocaine addict, I said, Okay, that explains everything. But um, oh, and you uh, have to do it. Hey, where are you from? You said you have the same accent as my family. I'm originally from Brooklyn. I went to medical school in New York. Okay, my, yeah. but I came out to Arizona 46 years ago. Oh wow, you still have your New York accent? Oh, I was in my 20s. Once you're in your 20s, you're not going to get rid of your accent or your body language or your attitude. Yeah, 
That's all New York attitudes. So. Yeah, you can tell. I can tell people from from New York and New Jersey just by seeing them walk for sure. <laughs> Yeah, you just tell. I love yeah. that. I I love that attitude. I think it's the yeah. best. It makes it well, it best. makes you a little more feisty. Did you see my Soho Forum debate with Adrian yes. Silverman? We've covered it. Yes, I was oh, going to okay. ask you about that. What did you? you <laughs> that I thought good. I cleaned her clock. You did great. Yeah, but unfortunately, I they know. used this thing called the Oxford Rules. I saw that. Which, depending on you know who, it's based on who swayed the most voters so we tied in that respect but but you know what that that's not important to me what's important to me is people view the debate i think any reasonable person is yes. going to think i cleaned her clock yeah because she so. did, i mean she had no answers to anything and it but was didn't, just, they, didn't she say she won because the soho uh forum right. director emailed me about yeah. it he yeah. said she didn't win shit she yeah. didn't win that debate well, she right. took it upon herself to say she won right they and 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 then the josh bloom wrote a scathing blog post about it and they backed away they changed their website yeah, yeah. it went yes but, but they did first claim that she won they did yeah it. yeah no you did a great job i wish you could do it thank that. you thank yeah. you Dr. at one Singer. point well at one point uh, her friend was there and he asked the question saying so let me get this straight you want oh i remember that. when we get to ask each other questions and she yeah. said to me so are you saying you should legalize drugs uh-huh. And I think she thought that was a gotcha question. Uh-huh. And and I was thinking, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But then when I got home, a couple of my friends who watched it, who agree with me, said, yeah, you know, you handle that well. But you know what? For a lot of people, it might have been a gotcha question yeah. because they probably freaked out by what you said. Yeah, that's so, why she did it, too. That's yeah. Probably, that's probably the other question was asked to her because or if she asked you that question, because that most people will think that. I mean, we're at the position yeah. in our country that. If someone says I took Vicodin after like having my leg cut off, people are be like, "What are you talking? Why would you do that? Don't you know about the opioid crisis?" I mean, it's in it's. I know. I know. I, it's, the amount of patients we get, like double mastectomies, just get Tylenol, and and my daughter just had a kidney stone. They gave her oral Tylenol in the hospital, even after comfort. And you know, Tylenol is has been shown to not be effective for pain. Yeah, it's only good for study, things like fever. The study they included in the CDC guidelines about about it about kidney stones was one versus Tylenol and they said that it shows Tylenol is better than Demerol which we don't even use in this country anymore but absolutely crazy well thank you so much okay I, I listen I, I call McNeil laboratories about that and yeah, I spoke with somebody it, about that a long time they said Tylenol should you know we laughed about it I said this is ridiculous and yeah. the fact that some people don't believe you are you're having pain after an yeah. amputation yeah, that just shows you how I go back to the word, the indoctrination. Josh Bloom people. and I wrote about Tylenol. I saw uh, that. We follow it all. Yeah, we all right. promote oh, it too. Thanks. We promote everything from the Cato. Talk yeah. soon, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Just a quick disclaimer that what you hear in our podcast is not to be considered medical or legal advice. We will always provide links in the show notes to give evidence for what we are saying.